Good morning, and welcome to Redeemer Covenant Church. Um, just a reminder that Pastor Bill Miller is out of town. Today we have Pastor Bill Anthes uh, graciously filling in. I'm Bill Lonis. We have a lot of bills. <laughs> Hopefully we paid the rest of the bills, so they're all set. Um, we have uh, a reminder, fa Faith and Family Fun Night is August 18th, this coming Friday. Daryl Strawberry, I believe, will be the speaker uh, at the stadium. Uh, it will really be quite an evening. Uh, there's a Family Fun Fest also, uh, which has details in your bulletin on the 19th, which would be Saturday. And we have a Back to School Bash ourselves, where we are going to give out backpacks. And Miss Lauren Cosmo will talk about that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Good morning. Um, so we are um, in full swing putting together the backpack um, giveaway. It's going to be on um, Sunday, August 27th, uh, immediately following our 1030 service. We're going to have um, fully catered. We're going to have food. We'll have tents set up outside, um, games and prizes and raffles for kids. Um, everyone is welcome to be there. I fully expect a great turnout from everybody here. We have a whole bunch of kids um, signed up and their families will be attending as well. Um, so I'm hoping to give them a great big Redeemer welcome and I'm hoping to make some, some new connections with some people in our community. Um, so the things that we will be um, giving to them. So Redeemer has, I'm always blown away by the generosity of this church. And so um, there are probably I don't know, 40 backpacks or something out there that people have been bringing in over the last couple of weeks. I don't know, a few weeks. The summer, I guess. Over, over the course of the summer, people have been just bringing in backpack after backpack. So we have more than enough backpacks to give um, the kids that have signed up. And we're going to be stuffing those backpacks full of notebooks and pencils and everything they need. We've read through, like, probably, I don't know, a dozen or two um, classroom lists that the schools put out, so we're making sure that um, kids are getting the supplies that they, like specific supplies that they need for each grade and each class that they're in. Um, so all of that is um, going to be put together and kids will be able to come and pick up their stuff, pick out um, some of their supplies and uh, walk away with a backpack full of stuff, a full belly from a beautifully catered meal and um, hopefully some new friendships and connections that have been made with our church. So um, I hope that everyone is able to attend. It'll be on Sunday, August 27th. Um, so we'll have our service at 1030, and then we'll be um, hopefully heading outside um, for a nice um, catered uh, barbecue meal, I think. <coughs> Pastor Bill's been the one handling all the catering stuff, so I think he's ordered some kind of honey chicken and macaroni and cheese, and it sounds really good. So I hope that you're all, oh, and a full Sunday bar. You can't go wrong with that. <laughs> so, um, so we're looking forward to that, and I hope to see all of you there on um, August 27th. If you want more information, there's these flyers are all out in the um, in the lobby there, and you can feel free to grab one. Am I? I'll just give it to you. All right. Let's stand and worship together. When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet sing through the night oh god the battle belongs to you and if you are for me who can be against me 
for Jesus there's nothing impossible for you when all I see are the ashes you see the beauty all I see is a cross God you see the empty tomb so when I find I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh God the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night oh God the battle belongs to you almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our god and almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadows you win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God and Almighty Fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Pray To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ 
who has resurrected me. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because of your love and faithfulness. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold, made by the hands of men. They have mouths, but cannot speak, eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear, noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel, feet, but they cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, so will all who trust in them. O house of Israel, trust in the Lord, he is their help and shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord, he is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord, he is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. May the Lord make you increase, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. You come at the right time when I least expect it never behind so why would I be surprised when you deliver every time on mountain tops you stay the same in valleys low you never change and I Your faithfulness remains. You go, you go before me to prepare a blessing you make a way. It's more than I could imagine more than I can fathom or comprehend on mountain tops you stay the same in valleys low you never change and I believe that I will see the goodness of Your faithfulness remains. God of my. 
present God of my future you write my story you hold it all together God of my present God of my future you write my story you hold it all together God of my present God of my future you write my story you hold it all together God of my present God of my future you write my story you hold it all together and I Your faithfulness remains. can separate us you are for me what can stand against us your love it won't let go i know it won't darkness shadows have no power over me fear is empty shame has no authority your love it won't let go i know it won't your thoughts your plans for me are good i know you hold my future and my hope your promises never fail your promises never fail healing and freedom as you speak favor over me faith is breaking all impossibility your name has overcome your name alone i know your thoughts your plans for me are good i know you hold my future and my hope your promises never fail your promises never fail your promises never fail your promises never fail I am standing on every promise that you make. I will see it come to pass in your name, in your name. Jesus, I will trust every word I hear you say. I will see it come to pass in your name, in your name. I am standing on every promise that you make. I will see it come to pass in your name, in your name. Jesus, I will trust every word I hear you say. I will see it come to pass in your name, in your name. standing on every promise that you make i will see it come to pass in your name in your name jesus i will trust every word i hear you say i will see it come to pass in your name in your name i will see it come to pass in your name in your name I will see it come to pass in your name, in your name. I know 
your thoughts, your plans for me are good. I know you hold my future and my hope. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us all here this morning, giving us a chance to get together, to worship you, to fellowship together. Um, Lord, I thank you for Pastor Bill Anthony's presence today, that um, he came here to bless us with a message from you this morning, Lord. And I ask you would uh, bless his lips and all of that as he's doing that later on this, this morning. Um, Lord, I thank you for all the churches in this area. And um, I ask you to be with everyone who is traveling this weekend, who's not around, that they would come back home safely and have a restoration time as they're gone. Um, I lift up this morning to you. Thank you. In your name, amen. And I think at this point we're doing three-minute party. Three-minute party. So enjoy. Again, we have three minutes for those of you that are new and attending. Uh, If you have not picked up a slip for the voting in the back, Paul has a slip in the voting for the back for you um, in regards to the LED light project. If you didn't get one, and you can just slip it in the back. Thanks. We will have one at the end, but I just thought it was a too.
with you guys. You know, I, I realized that the first time Enid and I walked through the doors was 1980. And the church has had uh, some adventures since that time, but it always feels like we're coming home. And uh, we're grateful for the chance to do that. The other thing I wanted to mention was it seems as though lately, every time I sub for Bill, Sarah gets just a little bit stronger looking. So Sarah, it's great to see you standing during the singing and uh, certainly a miracle at work in your body. Well, today we're going to think about a little reminder. I'm not going to bring to you this morning any new information, some radical new teaching, but to just bring a little reminder of something that I'm sure we have already heard and we already know, but hopefully the reminder will be helpful. We'll see if you know your old movies. Who can tell me what this movie is, the title of it? It came out in 1946. It stars Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, and Lionel Barrymore. Anybody know what that is? It's a Wonderful Life, exactly. Well, one of the supporting characters in this movie is called Uncle Billy. And if you remember Uncle Billy, he had a little problem remembering things. And so to help him remember, he would tie strings on literally all of his fingers as reminders of what he needed to do and where he needed to go. So Uncle Billy apparently thought that a little reminder every so often just might be helpful. Today we don't need strings, right? Because we have cell phones with the calendar app in them. And so this morning at 9.30 a.m., my cell phone did its little ringing dingy noise and up on the screen said, Redeemer, 10.30. And I said, thank you. This way I will not go to Binghamton instead of over to Morgan Road. The apostles thought that a little reminder to the saints of things they already knew would be helpful. For instance, the apostle Peter writes in his second letter, I will always be ready to remind you of these things even though you already know them. And he mentions a number of things that he thought it would be good to remind the saints about even though they had already gotten the information previously. Paul, when writing to his younger ministry partner, Timothy, says, remind them, the congregation, of these things. So apparently the apostles knew that we can sometimes forget things or that things that we know can get buried under a mountain of other stuff. So this morning, guys, I come to you as just a little bit reminder about the nature and the value of Scripture or the Bible. So nothing I say ought to be new news, just comes as a reminder of the precious treasure that we have in the Scripture, what it is and why we would want to read it and trust it. That's kind of a secondary title for the sermon. What is the Bible anyway? And why would we want to read it? And why would we want to trust it? Well, the Evangelical Covenant Church, as I'm sure you know, has a little affirmation that addresses that issue. And we say, we believe that the Bible is the word of God and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct. That gets us to break inertia. But then we need to ask the question, what do we mean when we call the Bible the Word of God? It's a wonderful phrase to use, and it's true, but what do we mean when we use it? Well, it seems to me, uh, coming from the Scripture, that when we say the Bible is the Word of God, we're pointing toward its ultimate source. What we're saying is that God has communicated to and through people to reveal himself to reveal himself, his character, his purposes, and how we fit in, <laughs> how we can be in a relationship with him. And the Bible is the repository of this incredibly rich revelation of which the Lord himself is the ultimate author. 
So here are a few texts that will kind of keep us moving. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, and I believe all of these verses are in the, the handout in your, um, in your bulletin. reads like this, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers through the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Now the first thing we can notice is something that I believe we're all aware of, is that our God, the God, is not a dumb, mute idol. Rather, he is a communicating God. And he has taken the initiative, and we would call that grace, he has taken the initiative toward people to reveal himself in what he has said and what he has done. And he spoke through people, in this case, prophets, to people. In this case, Israel and the the succeeding generations of that group of people. And he spoke in many portions, and a portion has to do with size. So, for instance, when you come to your cookout celebration on the last Sunday of the month, some of you are going to say, I want a small portion of ice cream. And then others of you who are smart will say, oh, nay, (laughs) I want a big portion of ice cream. So God has spoken to us in many portions. Moses comes with a gigantic portion of revelation. Obadiah with a little one. But they are all from the Lord. They are all God communicating to people. And in many ways, that tells us or reminds us that Scripture has a lot of different kinds of literature in it. And so sometimes we'll be reading a narrative, the story. Other times, Psalms and Proverbs. Yet other times, the Acts of the Apostles. Revelation. In many ways, God has communicated to us what he would like us to know. And then, I think this is obviously important, in these last days, he's spoken to us in his Son. And it's good to keep in mind that the person and work of Jesus is the most clear, complete, and final word from God that he wanted to say to the human race. Jesus is where it's at. Here's another little section, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. We read this. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Peter adds to our understanding in the following ways. First, He tells us that it's the Holy Spirit. He's the member of the Trinity who was at work in the hearts and minds of prophets to give them the revelation that he wanted his people to hear. And so we read that they spoke from God. In other words, what they spoke was not just what they thought God might be up to (laughs) or what their own imagination had dreamed up. It was actually spoken from God. He was the source of what moved in their hearts and what they shared with the other people. In other words, and we're going to see this yet again, the content of their prophecies and everything else had its origin in the Lord. And here he says, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. As soon as you see the word Scripture which in Greek, anyway, simply means writing, we're reminded that God's revelation comes to us in written form. It comes to us in Scripture or the Bible. And so as we're reading the Bible, what we're reading, by the tutelage of the Holy Spirit, hopefully, is what God wants us to know about himself, human life, relationship with him, where we began, where we're headed to, and how to get there. Scripture is God's communication to us. He is the ultimate author of the word. And then the last section that we're going to look at here is 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 17. Paul writing to his younger ministry partner to encourage him to hold fast, to pass the gospel on to others, and um, to not ever find himself shrinking back. He writes this, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, 
knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, or some translations render that holy scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Timothy, continue in the things that you know are true. One translation renders that word continual. Continue, remain faithful. He reminds him that he has been become convinced of certain truths. And so stand firm in what you know to be true. Don't be drawn away by heresy, which was a part of what was taking place, a part of the situation into which this letter was written. And don't run away when gospel ministry becomes difficult, because it will. <laughs> Stand firm. You're convinced of it. Hold it fast and be faithful. Paul refers here to sacred writings in the translation I tend to use, or holy scriptures. And then a little bit later he says, Uh, all scripture is inspired by God. What he would be referring to at that stage in history would be the Old Testament, the things that the Lord had revealed about himself that had been written down and preserved as his word, probably by his grandmother and mother, who are mentioned earlier in this letter as being people of faith. The word scripture, as I think I've mentioned, simply means writing. And so what God spoke and inspired, people wrote down and they saved it so that we could read it and be taught. Paul tells us that all of the scripture that was written down was inspired. And I know you guys have understood this word, but let me just see if I can earn my keep and explain what it means. Some translations render it God-breathed. And once again, it's focusing on the ultimate source of the Bible. It's not just religious thoughts by religious people. It's God going, "Ah," and inspiring people to write what he wanted them to write. It's breathed out by God. One um, person describes or, or defines the word inspired like this. It means that God divinely influenced human authors of scripture in such a way that what they wrote was the very word of God. And so once again, what is being emphasized here is the divine origin, the source of scripture. The ultimate author is none other than, none less than, God himself. That is basically the key idea that we're trying to drum into, well, not just to remind ourselves, really. And so because God is the author the the content of what he has given to us can give us the wisdom that leads to salvation he writes to Timothy by faith through through by faith in the Lord Jesus and it is profitable for a number of tasks and he mentions four of them so that the person of God the man of God the person of God can be adequate and equipped in their own Christian walk and in ministry opportunities can be equipped So God reveals, we receive, we trust, and we become increasingly equipped by the living and active word of God. So the key idea, as I've mentioned already, is that the Bible is a very special book. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it's unique. It's the only literature on earth that I would agree with the affirmation that it is really ultimately the word of God. That God is its source. It is very, very special. And yes, God used people with certain personalities in certain circumstances to address particular situations often. I mean, how many of our epistles, the letters in the New Testament, were written to address a situation? Most of them, right? So we we, we take all of that into account, We do our utmost, our best, to understand the context of books of the Bible and individual sections within those books. 
but our focus this morning is to insist, to affirm, to remind ourselves that what we have is nothing less than the Word of God. He and He Himself is the ultimate author. I told you you were going to know this already. This comes as a reminder to us all. Um, St. Augustine called the Bible a letter from home. I like that. A letter from home. The Father writing to his children by grace and instructing us in whatever matter we need to be instructed. Now, because God is the ultimate source of Scripture, many things follow from that. But until you lay the foundation, there's no sense putting the roof on. So having laid the foundation, we understand that because he is the ultimate author, many things follow from that. I am going to quickly mention four of them, just to remind us of the benefit in reading the scripture and in really becoming better and better friends with it. First, what flows from the fact that God is the author is that the scripture is true and trustworthy. It partakes of the character of its author. It is true and trustworthy. Psalm 119, which I think you probably know is a big acrostic poem speaking about God's word from all kinds of different angles. Verse 160 says this, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. Jesus, when he was praying to the Father in John 17, right before he was going to go to the cross, says this, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And it's a truth that has been put to the test over and over and over again and been found to be utterly reliable because its author is. In Proverbs chapter 30, the author says, every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Closely linked with this idea of truth, I think, is the idea of light for our path. As we walk through situations that seem to become increasingly dark the longer we go on. So when the darkness seems to obliterate sight, God has given us something with infinite lumens so that we can see where we're going. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, we read. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. How in the world are we ever going to know which end is up? with such ridiculous and competing worldviews vying for our attention. How are we going to know what is real and true and authentic and consistent with reality, guys? The Bible. Because God is the author. And he doesn't want us walking in darkness. So as we walk through this world, we have a trusted resource whose source is God himself. Now, because God is the source... His word is also powerful and effective, is it not? It's not just dead letter, inert, sits there, does nothing. In Isaiah 55, you remember that famous passage about the rain and snow coming down from heaven? Well, in verse 12, he says, So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. God's word can succeed in whatever manner he wants. It will accomplish things. His word is effective. The Apostle Paul, when he was saying goodbye to the um, elders of the church of Ephesus in Acts 20, said this, Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to do two things, to build you up, and to give you the inheritance among those who have been sanctified. His word of grace is able to build you up, and me too, and all of us together. It's effective. It does things in the lives of those who are exposed to it and receive it. You remember in Ephesians 6, where Paul is reminding the readers that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
You know that famous armor of God passage? And he lists some of the resources God has put at our disposal so that we can stand firm. And that phrase comes, over, comes uh, out over and over again in that passage. And then toward the end he says, take the helmet of salvation and what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When we are in any kind of temptation scenario or spiritual warfare or whatever, God provides us with a weapon. It's the sword of the Spirit. It's the Word of God. Which reminds me, and you too probably, of when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights being tempted by the tempter. And we're told of three specific temptations that he laid out before the Lord to see if he could get him to bite because <laughs> every other person had up to that point in history. And in each case, Jesus begins his answer with three words. What are they? What are they? It is written. written. Matthew 4. It is written. It is written. It is written. He took the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and quoted Deuteronomy back to the tempter. And he emerged, as you know, completely victorious. So third, because the, God is the source of the word, it is enduring. It's not the kind of thing that's going to be in vogue today and then five years later be passe. Oh no. It endures. It remains. It abides forever. If the world lasts another hundred years, guess what? The word of God is going to be as true then and as effective then as it is now. Now, if we had a choir, I'd say I could take an amen from the choir, because that was a really good point. But since we don't have a choir, I'll keep going. <laughs> First Peter, chapter 1, he says this, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. For, and then he quotes from Isaiah, all flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of grass, the grass withers, the flower falls off, but in contrast to everything that's uh, merely human, that fades and decays and goes away, he says, but the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. It endures. It's true. It's powerful. It's lasting. It endures. And then finally, it brings us encouragement and hope. Romans 15, verse 14. I don't think this one's on your handout. But whenever I read this verse, I think of Gordon Bell and I think of Bill Lonis. But whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. <coughs> this little reminder, and I know that that's all it was, but this little reminder of things that we already know and I trust that we already believe was just meant to bring back to the fore what an amazing treasure and gift we have in the Bible. God, the one who said light be and light was, God, that one, <laughs> has spoken has revealed what he wants us to know about him, his purposes, his character, and how we can be in a relationship with him, we must always value this immensely and highly. Just a reminder, next week we're going to ask the question not what is the Bible and why should I read it, but how. It's going to be immensely, intensely practical. Once again, I don't think I'm going to be giving you something that you've never heard before, but it should come as a reminder to all of us that there are different levels of and ways of engaging with the Scripture. And when we take this gift and we receive it and we live in it, um, good stuff happens. There's good fruit. So let me pray and then we'll, uh, we'll be uh, done for now. Father, thank you for the gift that is the Scripture. And we really do believe that it is inspired, that you breathed it out. We thank you that you use people and situations, but most of all, Father, we thank you that it is a letter from home. 
We pray, Father, that as we read, the Holy Spirit would open the eyes of our hearts so that we can behold wonderful things from your law and be changed thereby. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, your final word. Amen. Amen. Shalom.